Are you guys ready? We're going to go a little deeper into Ephesians. Ready to take what now? Why not? All right, that sounds good to me. All right. All right, I've asked you to do something for me during this series. I've asked you to turn off the cell phone, not use the Bible app, but to use your Bible. And if you didn't have a Bible, we would have some here for you. I asked you to uh, maybe take some notes. And if you do that on your phone or your device, I say, well, you know what? I keep them off because I got some paper and some pens and pencils up here. And as we do this, um, again, I just want to re I'm not saying that these things are bad, but what we're trying to, what we've been talking about is in the book of Ephesians, is that what we need to do as a people is disconnect so we can reconnect. Now, I'm not just talking about disconnecting from uh, things, uh, uh, from like your, your devices. I'm, I'm also talking about disconnecting from maybe traditional thought or things that you've always known. And remember, I ended the service last week and I asked you a question. I asked you if you are willing or if you would be willing to give up all the things that you hold dear, all the things that you thought you knew, all these things, if you would be willing to give those to the Lord so that He can do a new thing. And we had, we, had, we had people come up, we had a bunch of people up here, and we all, we all determined together that we were going to do this, amen? Alright, so that's where we left off, and we just got through the first three verses of Ephesians. Alright? Um, I want to start off, um, we're going to be in Ephesians, but I want to start off in Psalms, so if you could flip over to Psalms 25. Um, I read this to the, to the worship team this morning, but I spent a little time with them, and... Um, I want to start this off because I really feel like for today to get across what, what the Lord is wanting us to learn, uh, this is just going to, uh, well, if you may know anything about pumps, sometimes you got to prime the pump to get it to run. Well, I'm, I'm just feeling that we need to prime some pumps around here, amen? amen. Now, you ladies who are Beth Moore, oh, they're primed. oh, you're primed now. You're primed to go. So, ladies. You need to be praying for those who didn't go, all right? Because um, I'm telling you, we've got a good word, and, and I think it's good. But I just kind of want to prime uh, what we're going to be learning about. And so I'm going to read Psalms 25, and I'm just going to read 4 uh, through 15. No, I'm going to go all the way in. Well, I'm just going to read till I quit. How about that? All right. So I'm going to start with verse 4, though. And it says, Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. And I will wait for you all day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithful love, for they have existed from antiquity. Do not remember the sins of my youth or the acts of my rebellion in keeping with your faithful love. Remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. The Lord is good and upright, therefore He shows sinners the way, and He leads the humble in the right in what is right and teaches them His ways. All the Lord's ways show faithful love and truth to those who keep His covenant and decrees. Because of Your name, Yahweh, forgive my sins, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will show him the way he should choose, and he will and he will live a good life, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear Him, and He reveals His covenant to them. My eyes are always on the Lord, for He will pull my feet out of the net. <clears throat> Amen. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am alone and afflicted. <coughs> the distresses of my heart increase. Bring me out of suffering. Consider my affliction and trouble and take away all of my sins. Consider my enemies because they are numerous. They hate me violently. Guard me and deliver me and do not let me be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and what is right watch over me for I wait for you. God, redeem Israel. Redeem the church, Lord, from all its distresses. Amen and amen. Well, I don't know about you, but that's good. That's a good priming right there, isn't it? Because I don't think you can read that without understanding what God wants to do for us. 
Okay, remember in the first three <clears throat> verses we talked about, Paul's introducing this letter that was written in jail, that was being passed from church to church. But he started with, when we really got into three, uh, we, we talked about that. The first word is that we were to be praising him. Praising him. And, 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 and so we just stopped at three and we just began to talk about praising him. And we began to talk about why it is because he said that he was going to, uh, it says, praise God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. And we took that scripture and we decided, we looked at what, what the spiritual blessings of the heaven are not. Right? Because we confuse this verse with some other things. The spiritual blessings that we need and the one this is talking about is relationship with our Abba Father, God the Father. That is our spiritual blessing. And if that's all that God gives us, shouldn't that be enough? <laughs> So as we begin to kind of walk through this, and we and we stop there, um, we're going to jump into it, and, and we're going to probably go pretty slow because I learned something. Um, this passage, 3 through 14, in the Greek, is one long sentence. One long sentence. You want to talk about a run-on. The only translation... That gives it to us in one sentence like that is the King James Version. All the other versions break it up into paragraphs and sentences and this and that. And so what we tend to do with this is we begin to look at it and we begin to take, well, I just want this part of it. Come on. And we begin to say, well, this is good, but I don't like this. You see, we look at the Bible, we look at this passage as, a, uh, as an all-you-can-eat buffet and we're just going to pick and choose. That's not how this works. And I'm just going to be bold enough to tell you that if you're reading the Bible, finding things that you want to find, you're going to find them. But you're throwing out everything else that you didn't want to look for. You know what I'm saying? This book, from beginning to end, is a meta narrative, or the big word for the larger story. <clears throat> and the larger story... Is found and it's repeated in this book over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it is about, and I want to hear someone say amen, the redeemed. It is about how we become his children. How we are adopted in. How we are taken out of bondage and we are set our feet on freedom. And I'm not talking freedom in the United States. I'm talking freedom in the heart and a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and, and that leads us to our Father in heaven because... Because Jesus ascended and he's there and he's making, um, he's making, well, he's our lawyer. He's saying, hey, yeah, you're right, God. They are not holy people, but I died for them. I covered their sins. And so it is good. It is good. And then we go back here and he goes, and I sent the Holy Spirit to guide him and teach him. So guess what, the Lord? They're just on the beginning of their past. They're going to be walking with you. And he's advocating for us. He is our biggest cheerleader. That's what this story is about. And guess what? It just completes it through. That's why you can't look Beth Thomas, I mean Beth showed us something visually. Here's the thing. In the middle of your Bible, you've got this blank page. It's at the end of Malachi, and then it's at the beginning of, of uh, no, Micah and Matthew. And there's a blank page. Most of us have a blank page there, right? And we look at this like two different books. We can't. It's one book. Telling the same story. It's one book saying, this is how you become my children. It's one book. That blank page, it does represent something. 400 years of silence because the people refuse, listen, refuse to tear down idols in the high places. Didn't we talk about that last week? we got to tear down the idols in our life. And I'm going to tell you what, if we don't tear them down, God, there is a chance that God will be silent again. And I don't know about you, but I do not want to live in another 400 years of silence from our Heavenly Father. Now, let's get into this. So, I'm going to read three, and then I'm going to go right into four, and then we're going to stop. We're going to break it down, okay? Because I can't just break it down section by section, and I can't just break it down, like, you know, paragraph by paragraph, because it's one big thing. I'm, I'm going to have to kind of go almost word for word a little bit. You, you okay with that? Like, just a little bit, Okay. Uh, and, and don't, don't, I'm going to throw out some Greek to you today, and I don't want you to, like, get all freaked out about it, okay? Um, but you'll, you'll be all right. You'll, you'll get it. It's pretty simple. Verse 3. 
Praise the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Amen. For He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight in love. Alright, verse 4 just hits us right between the eyes. Amen. All right, well, let's look at this. Let's break this down. All right. First of all, there's a lot of pronouns here. And it's really easy to get mixed up who he, who him is, because it's just whatever, and, and it's, it's really easy. So I'm going to try to do this. For he, who's he? God the Father. Right? So listen to this. So God the Father... Chose us. We could go home right there. Because I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't have a purpose. Like, I feel alone. I, I don't feel like I've been chosen. I, I, I feel like, what, you know, and it's like, I, I mean, I've even heard Christians say, well, you know, it's not like I'm one of God's chosen. What? God the Father chose you. He chose me. You are wanted. You know, in a world that is hurting as bad as it is, you know what the real question is? And I really believe this. It's because the people in this world are saying, I don't feel wanted by anything. The reason we have... I'm, okay. The reason we're having race issues in this country is because people, there are certain people who don't feel wanted. Whether that's real or not, it doesn't matter. That's how they feel. Come on, I need an amen. All right. Guess what? We are all wanted by our Heavenly Father. We were chosen. And, and you know what? By the way, we weren't chosen by circumstance. Come on now. Because most of us say, yeah, He chose us because, yeah, well, we're, you know, we're what's left. <laughs> Think about it. Well, maybe, maybe you haven't verbalized that, but that's how we act. Right? Listen to this. He chose us in Him. Who is Him? Jesus. God the Father chose us in Jesus before the foundations of the world. Before, in the beginning, God chose us. Now, it took a long time for us to get here, amen? And He, and he did. He chose, he chose Israel. He chose... He chose a certain people. And, and he chose them not because he was favorite. He chose them because Abraham was faithful. And so Abraham's descendants were chosen because of Abraham. Now so many in the church say, well, they're just God's chosen people. And we really don't know why they are. And we kind of get upset about it. Come on. We go, why not me? Well, he did choose you. Let me tell you something. Abraham was holy. He was the only one holy that God could find, it seems like, in Scripture. And he said to him, Abraham, I want you to go somewhere where you're not even going to know, where you don't even, I'm not even giving you GPS. In other words, all you've got to do is you walk out your front door and you put one foot in front of the other, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, and I will tell you where to turn, and I will tell you where to stop, and I will tell you where to go. See, that's how God chose His people. Unfortunately, I really think the church has turned it around to where we stand up and we tell God where we think He should send us. It's not how it works. So God chose the people because of one man. Let me tell you something right now. Can, 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 can I just say this? If, if it were up to you, maybe this is a good internal question. If God was looking down and saying, I just want one, I just want one, would you be willing to walk out your front door one foot in front of the other without knowing where you're going? You see what I'm saying? Because there's a generation behind you that God wants to choose, and he needs to choose it, but it's got to start with you. And so, before all this happened, before... Genesis, before Abraham, before the story of the meta-narrative and the whole redemption story of the Bible. By the way, Old Testament speaks the gospel just like New Testament. And, 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 and all these things, 
Throughout the beginning of this, God's original plan, number one on the docket of God's to-do list, when he got up one morning, was to choose you. God chose me, but you know what? That doesn't make me make me feel any better. Am I speaking to somebody's heart tonight? If we're going to tear down idols, let's tear down idols. You know, humans cannot stand in the place of God. Uh, Beth Moore was talking about uh, yesterday. Um, about we're all playing in a symphony. We all have a, a place to be. Like, we're not in the audience. We're on the stage. And we're all playing an instrument. Well, actually, in reality, we are the instrument that God is playing. But we're all playing. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm translating a little different because I believe that, that we have Holy Spirit as our maestro, our conductor, right now. Because we're surrounded by this big cloud of witnesses. That's the audience. And, and oh, by the way, that's just not the saints that have gone. That's everybody that is watching you is the big cloud of witnesses. Good, bad, ugly, good, evil, angels, demons, everybody. They're all watching us. And so God, if we're allowing God to play us, but here's the one thing she said that really stood out to me, and that's why I'm bringing it out, because I think it goes with what I just said. The fact is, is that if you notice in, the, in an orchestra, everyone sits in a chair where everyone can see the maestro, right? All right? Well, see, what's happened is if you feel like you have, like, if this is, if God's choosing you is not enough, what's happened is, is you've put somebody else in that section right in front of you where you can't see the maestro. And you need to move it. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? you got to move it. Say, so, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. Well, I don't know how to do that because I don't know what that is for you. But I can tell you this. There is someone who does know, who has the answer. Uh, his name is God the Father who gave us Jesus, who gives us the Holy Spirit, and gives us the Word of God. We have the answer if we're willing to look at it. The problem is, I think, is most of the time we are not willing to look because of what he's asking us to do in it. But I don't want to move that person because I've got some bitterness and, and anger. And I don't, I, you know, I, I, if, if I do that, that means I can't focus on that. That's right. I'm going to tell you what that's called. Fruit. You see, he chose us before the foundation of the world. But when he chose us, that he also chose us to be something. And in my home, and it says to be. I want you to know that phrase to be in the Greek means to exist. So God chose us from the foundations of the world to exist in what? Well, he gives us two words, and we're all going to really like these words. We are to exist in holiness and blamelessness. How many feel like we're doing good there? Well, you see, holiness, or to be holy, in the Greek is hagios. That's the Greek word, hagios. And, and what that means is, is to be as a sanctuary or to be as dedicated to be saved. You, even the original word for this, hagios, does not have anything to do with what I do. It has everything to be with where I am. If I am with God, then God sees me as holy. So your holiness, you know, I grew up, I mean, there's a lot of people who grew up in what they call the holiness movement. Um, there, there's all these things. I think we have some misunderstanding that if we're holy, then that means we have to be perfect. I'm sorry. Holiness does not equate with perfection. There's only one person who happened to be holy and happened to be perfect, and it was Jesus. 
So holy just means that we are in the presence of. Hang on to that thought because I'm going to get there, okay? Hang on to that thought. So we're to exist in this and also to be blameless. First of all, let me ask this question. Do we feel holy? Do we feel holy? No, I, I'm going to tell you there's a lot of times I don't feel holy. But every time I don't feel holy, let me tell you something. Uh, God tells me, then, well, where are you existing in? Are you existing in your own strength or am I? Are you existing in my understanding or are you existing in your own understanding? For remember, son, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Alright. Blameless. I'm not going to try to pronounce that one. It just left my brain and I'm not going to fight it. <laughs> you see, we're not blameless. So when we first read this, we automatically sit there and say, well, I can't be holy and I can't be. It's a no-win situation for me. Yes, you're right. And how is that good news? Because it's not based on, what, it's not based on you. It doesn't rest on you. It rests on God. It rests on Jesus. It rests on the Holy Spirit. What I'm telling you here right now is because this is the key thing. This is what Jesus did for us. You're right. We can't be holy. We can't be blameless. We have to have the cross. We have to have the blood shed. It is, and, and because of that, so we're doing this. Can I get an amen? This is why we praise him. Okay, I want you to keep thinking this. This is why we praise him. Because of what Jesus did. Because in Jesus, in Jesus... By the word in, that, that's like showing the position, the preposition. It shows position. In Jesus, we were chosen. We are in Jesus. Jesus said in John, remember we just spent over a year in John together? I, Jesus, God's in Jesus. They're together, right? And what do they say? They are in us. So in Jesus, we can be holy and blameless. In his sight. In love. In other words, we can put it this way. Because of his great love, this is how he sees us. Holy and blameless because of we're in Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. See, what I'm saying is, is we got to be excited about the gospel message. Yeah. All right. All right, fine. So he chose us. I get it, Pastor. What does the next verse say? Let's just keep moving on. He predestined us to be adopted through Jesus for himself according to his favor and his will. And I'm going to go ahead and do six. To be praised, to the praise of his glorious grace that he favored us with in the beloved. All right. Who is he? Who is he? God. You see what we've done? Started with God, then Jesus, now we're back to God again. God, he. Hebrews would say Elohim. Say Elohim. God. Predestined. Now I want everybody to put your theological hats off and set it aside, okay? Come on now. Because let me tell you something. There has been a lot of man-made garbage over one little word. There has been church splits over this word. You got two godly men, Wesley and Calvin. They disagreed on this point and then split them badly. I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong, okay? But I'm saying as a church, let's use the history as an example. Let's be careful that we don't let a doctrine made of man split us. You say, well, pastor, it's not made of man, it's in the scripture. Predestined. Well, hang on. That's because we misunderstand the word predestined. That's because we haven't done the work to go back to the Greek and find out what that means. And actually, let's go farther than that. Let's take what that root word is back to the Hebrew and let's find out what God really wants us to know. Because remember, though the New Testament was given to us in Greek, it was all spoken in Hebrew or Aramaic. Except for the letters which were written in Greek. Alright, so, let's look at this word predestined. So we're going to go to the Greek. Prorizo is the word that we use for predestined. 
And this word has an interesting meaning. Um, it's a fixed boundary. Okay? One meaning. A fixed boundary. In advance. To drive forward. It's a fixed boundary in advance to drive forward. Why don't you think about that for a second? We all need boundaries. And God has given us a fixed boundary. The relationship with Him is only through Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. It's a fixed boundary. That is a, that is a spine issue. That can't change. If someone doesn't say that, you can't agree with them with Scripture. If that's your belief and someone says something contrary to that, well, we got an issue. Okay? So now we look at this. We have a boundary. God put it for us in advance. We have history that tells us this is how what we can see the Scripture gives it to us in advance. But the whole point of being predestined is that we are allowing God to drive us forward. You know, my, one of my favorite stories is the Exodus story, right? Because I think that's the redemption story, the beginning of the redemption story. That's, what did God do? He drove his people forward to a fixed boundary that he had already placed in advance. See, we are all predestined. Predestined doesn't mean that God just chose a few. God chose us all. There is not anybody who has not been chosen by God. From the foundation of the world, God chose us, each and every one of us, even those that we don't like, even those that are in a different country, even those of a different race, God chose all of us. Can I get an amen? amen. We are all predestined. God chose. God didn't he's good. It wasn't like he was dealing cards, y'all. Yeah. Good pile, bad pile, good pile, bad pile, good pile, bad pile. This one I don't know. Where we'll just get it. Good pile, bad He didn't do that. You know what he did? He says, I'm going all in. I love them all. <laughs> And so, so we're all predestined. And what were we driving forward to? What have we been pushed forward to? It says this right here. For He, in His sight, we are found holy and blame, uh, we are seen holy and blameless. And in love in His sight, we see this. So He predestined all of us to what? What is He driving us for? Adoption in Jesus through Jesus Christ. Once again, say chosen. chosen. Say adopted. adopted. I want you to look at someone next to you, and I want you to look at them, and I want to say, you have been adopted. Go ahead. I look to the other side and say the same thing. My wife, I'm just actually, my wife has got no one there. It's kind of funny. So right now, my wife's purse is adopted, and, my, and it's, it's great. It's king. It's a beach ball moment. That sometimes happens to me. Anyway. So he's been driving us all forward to adoption. And we don't get it. Jesus Christ, just like we are. And so those little girls become our nieces 
and, and we get to love on them. They have been brought in and brought home. How many people in your neighborhood are not adopted yet because we won't have the guts to tell them that Jesus loves them? I'm not talking about being the bullhorn guy, okay? Uh-uh. I'm not talking you be that guy that yells in the corner, turn or burn. I want to run over him. And then put it in reverse. Because that's not what Jesus does. Jesus says, Jesus looked at Israel. Listen to this. He stood on a mountain. He's getting ready to go into Israel, right? He's getting ready to go in. Before they are getting ready to crucify him. And what does he say? Good riddance? Oh, how I wish I could gather you all as chicks under my wing and be your mom and your dad. How I wish I could just... He was saying, I want to make you my children. I'm talking about reaching out to people around us in love, in grace, in mercy, just like Jesus did for us. We're adopted through Jesus Christ. For who? Listen, for himself, God. He says, what does he say? I am El Elkanah. I am a jealous God. Because he wants you for himself. I don't know about you, but in the spirit, I just felt God's arms just wrapped around me. I have got goosebumps all over me. And it is not because it's cold in here, because I'm dying up here. Because I just felt. And I think some of you in this room just got it. Gotcha. All right. Listen to this. According to his favor and will. According to his favor and will. In other words, favor, it's just giving. It's just, it's, 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 okay. The best way I can describe favor, because I think sometimes is, is, uh, I'm going to just go, I'm going to go with this definition because, or this visual thing for you. It's, uh, in my family, I have three boys. And uh, two of them have, in our family, have become of age, okay? We do a special thing where we bring our kids and they hit an age and... Almost all three. Yeah, it's almost all three. We got one coming up and... Yeah, it's you. Anyway, we got one coming up, okay? But, but what we do is we gather, we gather around him and we bless him and we say, Hey, you're now responsible for yourself spiritually, right? So you can't... It's not my coattails. Get off my coattails. Um, it's like... It's, it's short. It's not, you know, it's not like you're on your own. Here's a $20 bill. I wish you the best of luck. It's not that kind of thing. It's, it's spiritually you and God. It's becoming a man. Okay? It's like, this is what men, this is what men do. There's a couple things men do. Uh, men um, plan. Okay? And, 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 and they take responsibility for who they are. You know, there's these things, and so we just kind of we kind of bless them in that. We say this is what the Lord says in Scripture. We pray over them, and, and then whatever. And, and, and there's a moment in which I get to do something. The Father, as I'm praying over them, I get to put my hand on them and pray. It's the proudest moment of my life. It's one of the scariest too. Okay, but that's favor. That's that's me. That's me coming over here. Come here, Jesse. Come here. I'm just going to demonstrate this, okay? Because he's like, whatever. He's going to... It's me getting to pray over my son. Put my hands like this. This is pride. As a dad. Right? Do you know what? God the Father comes up to each and every one of us. And he puts his hand on us. He says, I love you and I'm proud of you. And I give you my favor. It's not about what we give them. It's about his presence in our life. Can I get an amen? I'll pay for that later, I know. And then his will. His favor and his will. God's deep desire is to put his hand on us and say, I love you and I'm proud of you. Have you ever pictured God that way? Or is God the guy in the long white robe with the big long beard carrying a staff and he's got his finger out waiting to zap you? 
You know? Oh no, you see, my daddy's a good shepherd. My daddy's the one who came after me and he put me on his shoulders and he carried me back to the pen when I was the prodigal son. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, so, so this is how it is. There's some favor, there's some love, and, and that's his will. And, and because of all this, it says to praise him in his glorious grace that he favored us with the beloved. Okay. Wow, I don't even know if I'm going to get past six today, guys. I don't even know what time it is. But let me tell you something, because as I go, and this is going to keep appearing, but so God wants the favorites. That's his will. And he wants to the praise of his glorious grace, his glorious grace. Let's look at grace first. Grace, grace. I know in the past that we've said it's unmerited favor, but I don't like that definition anymore. And the reason I don't like it is, is because, well, to be honest with you, his favor's got some conditions to it. Okay. I mean, it says, if you love me, you will follow his commandments, okay? So there's some things we have to do, and I get that. But grace here is, 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 is what it says in, 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 the, in the original word. Um, boy. Okay, here we go. Chorus, doxa. And it simply means a gift, a kindness, a favor, freely given. So if grace is just saying, it's my favor, freely given. It's my, I love you, my hands of grace are on you. You're freely given. And, 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 and you know, that comes with some understanding that no matter what we do, he's, he loves us. Right? And so, as, as we're talking about this, he's saying, okay, this is this. And, but it's glorious grace. His glorious grace. Heresius, this is grace. This is this is huge for me, y'all. Glorious. God given. Glorious is a uh, well, how do I describe it? I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with you, I'm struggling here right now. Because I want to get to the next point. It's so bad. Because, see, his glory. There is a teaching in the rabbinic understanding, okay? The Jews taught this thing, and this, this word is not found in Scripture, okay? But it's a word, and you've probably heard it before, it's called Shekinah, okay? The Shekinah glory, okay? The word Shekinah is a physical or a physical manifestation. Glory, it's His presence. Shekinah glory is a physical expression of God's presence. Okay? Now, because this is what it's talking about. You follow the glorious grace. You follow that. You link it back to the to the words that are closely related to the Hebrew and the Aramaic. This is what we're getting. Okay. Now, this is huge for me. Okay. I need to go to another story in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, Moses wants to see God's glory. He wants to see God. You know. First of all, whew, that that guy got guts. He wants to see him. And God said. Well, you can't handle the truth. That's pretty much what he said. I mean, he didn't say it that way, but in my understanding, he's like, you can't handle it. And so he says, but I'll tell you what I'll do, because, because I know your heart, Moses. You know, you want to see the glory. You want to see the Shekinah. You want to see a manifestation of my presence, because, because it's not because you're trying to be selfish. It's not because you want to be, me to be, you don't, I'm not, you're not asking me to prove myself. You're asking is that you want to see your father. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Because you can't handle it, so there's that little crack in the rock, and I'm going to put you in that crack. And the scripture says that I'm going to cover you with my hand. So Moses gets in this crack, in this crevice, and I don't know how it looked. I wasn't there. But it says God hand covered him. I don't know what that looked like. But so he's sitting there, and then God walked past the crevice, and then God removed his hand so that all that Moses could see was his backside. Him leaving. Okay? And he got to see that. And, and he was so blown away by that and by what he saw there. It says that everybody else knew that he had seen God. Why? It said his face was glowing. Because the manifestation of God 
was so real. Okay? Amazing, right? Awesome story. All right, let's just keep walking this out in Scripture. How has God shown and revealed His presence to us now? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus was a physical manifestation of God through His Son, Jesus. So Jesus became the Shekinah glory while He was here. But the world knew Him not. The world didn't recognize the Shekinah glory. It didn't have the same effect as it did on Moses. Because people had gotten so far away. People had gotten so far away that they didn't recognize this. And so even though they had all the scriptures and all the backing, they didn't get it. Let's keep walking through history. Can we do this? Because let me tell you something. God, I think I've got a revelation here, and, and I'm really excited about it, but it's also the most challenging thing I probably have ever said from this pulpit, okay? How is God going to do that now? Well, we know that Jesus left, and he says, I've got to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I'll take you up. You know, In other words, he is making his, his house, his insula, he is making that for us. That's what we're waiting on, right? Man, he's been waiting. We've been waiting a long time, man. I'm telling you, that pad's got to be awesome. You know what I'm saying? But he's, we're waiting. And actually, I think really what it is, because if, if you really think about it, he lives in our hearts. So really what we're waiting for him is to build is for his church to be ready for him to come to the right. Different understanding, isn't it? But anyway, okay. Forget that. That was a side note. But, so he went. And he says, but I'm going not, I'm just not going to leave you alone. Because i got to go do my job at the right hand of the Father. I'm going to send what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's going to come, the Comforter, and He's going to teach you in things. Because I'm doing something in a new way, right? So, if God is in Jesus, and Jesus is in Him, and Jesus is in us, and He sent His Holy Spirit to be in us, and we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, that means God's presence dwells within us, which means that His Shekinah glory should be seen as a physical thing through us. So when people see us, they should see God. They shouldn't see us. We are supposed to be the Shekinah glory of God. Now, I have been in a place where God showed up and I saw something that I call the Shekinah glory, and it was. Okay, but I'm going to tell you this. We should see it in each other. Can I, can I just say this? What would the difference be if his church really became a physical manifestation of God? What would change? See, that's in us. You see, when Jesus came and he was here on earth and he walked into the temple and he turned over tables and he got upset because um, they took the place where God's glory was supposed to dwell. And where that Shekinah glory sat was on the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubims. And the glory <laughs> fell and, it, and God lived there. The reason Jesus became so upset was because of what people had made the sanctuary. They had made it into a place that it wasn't supposed to be. They made it into a place that was all about selfishness. They made it into a place about how it's all about themselves and self-idols. And, and really what they were doing was putting the idol of money and the idol of success and the idol of wealth in the place of where God should sat. It was like they removed God from the mercy seat and they would put money and they put things and they put all these things in that place. And, and Jesus said, you have made the house of God into a den of thieves because they have stolen what rightfully belonged to God. 
And I'm here to tell you today that that is exactly what has happened in the heart of the church. Is that we have allowed something to come in that should not come in. The church is not what we're supposed to be. We are to be the Shekinah glory. The Lord is supposed to sit and dwell with each and every one of us. And we have robbed God of what belongs to Him. And it is time that we stop. I don't know about you, but I am a chief sinner when it comes to this. Because I let anger, I let personal things, I let, I, let, um, I, I, I let the past get in the way. I let everything of what God is supposed to be doing. I mean, I'm supposed to be walking in new creation. I'm supposed to be transformed by the renewing of my mind through the Word of God. But we as a people even have a hard time getting into the Word on a daily basis. How can we be transformed? We need to allow the Shekinah glory to set upon us once again. Because, let me tell you something, it says that to the praise of His glorious grace that, it was, uh, that He favored with us in the Beloved. And we want to say, well, the Beloved is Jesus. No, the Beloved is us. The word Beloved is translated to the ones that God loves. That is us. We are the Beloved. I'm telling you, church, God is calling this church to something different. He's calling churches all over the world to something different. Yes, I get it. In the Old Testament, He said that He is getting ready to do something new. He is continuing to do something new. We have to put away the things. This is why this is so heavy on my heart. Because I feel like, like we have turned the house of God into nothing more than a social club. This building is not holy. This building is a tool used by God. This is a place where we can gather. This is not a holy place. You know what's the holy place? Every one of you sitting in the seats. You are where the Shekinah glory lives. We got to get this right. I, I can't. And no wonder why people look at the church and shake their heads and say, I do not want anything to do with that. So, because of this, we have redemption in Him through His blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses according to His riches of His grace that is lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He planned in Him for the administration of the days of fulfillment to bring everything under in the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, both things in heaven and things on earth in Him. Yeshua Jesus HaMashiach is the Messiah. Do you know what seven through 10 is really describing once again the Passover. You, you see it here? He said, look, the Shekinah glory is going to be, and the whole thing about the Shekinah glory and where it sits between the cherubim is on the days of Passover, the blood of the Lamb was shed and it was sprinkled on the mercy seat for the forgiveness of sins. Now he's talking about, we got to praise God because the mercy seat has been covered with blood once again. And he's done it once and for all through Jesus. And all, by the way, the forgiveness of our sins, our trespasses. I love this thing. The word sin really means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. It means to be off a little bit. It doesn't mean what the church has made sin into. We're all going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. Trespasses is this. Where do we, when someone crosses our boundary, what do we say? They trespassed, right? Okay, so I love this because I've never thought of this word before in this sense, really. Uh, until I begin to study it. Well, God is saying, you have crossed over a line that my people should never cross over and you have trespassed. Get back on your own property. <laughs> I mean, this is good. I mean, and I'm sitting here going, look, what, and isn't that what the Passover was about? I'm going to take you out of your bondage because that's not where my people belong. My people belong in freedom. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and there is freedom and there is glory and there is grace. So what we have to understand is, is that through this whole process, we have redemption. The ransom, redemption, is what the word means. Ransom has been paid in full. 
Okay? So we have been redeemed in Jesus through His blood, the forgiveness of Forgiveness, the root word in the Greek is offensive, is what we get the word offenses from. But it has an A in front of it. A in front of it is the opposite, it's the antonym. Put an A in the Greek, that means it's the antonym, right? In other words, it's God looking at us and saying, you have not offended me. Your offense has been taken away. You're forgiven. Okay, that's where we get that. And so, so what we're looking at is saying, look at this. He said, you have forgiveness in, in going to places where you shouldn't be. Your trespasses. According to his riches of his grace, his favor, that he has lavished, or really that word lavished, is poured out, overflowing on us with what? All wisdom and all understanding. know that God chose us to be. He's chosen us. I mean, God never intended for his gospel to go forward without us. We're chosen from the foundation. I mean, it's what scripture's saying. And so maybe we just need to spend some time. And I don't know what you all, what, what you guys got prepared. I don't know what, what I can't remember. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is maybe we should just do this. Why don't you guys do a song? Do what you're going to do. I want to open the altars. Okay. Um, and uh, can I have um, a prayer? Prayer people come forward, please. Um, I, I, I feel like we need um, keepers. Um, um, uh, Colossal Foss guys. Um, and, 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 and their wives, if you would. Um, and I want you to line this, this. I want you to line this stuff. I want you to be right here. I want you to line this thing. Okay. Um, up here, not because of it, they're special, but they're not special, okay? They're just like everybody else. Um, but I um, I know that they're willing to pray for you. And so what I'm going to ask, and, and guys, if you're, if you're, yeah, connection class teachers, any, any you know, uh, I, I really feel like what this is about today is about people coming forward and saying, I have to live like the Shekinah glory is in me. And I need some prayer. And so I don't want to make this, you've got all kinds of people in all different walks of life up here you find someone that you're comfortable with, but I really believe that God is calling us for this time, as they're going to sing and they're going to do this, to come forward and to pray, but have someone pray with you, and, 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 and allow God to just work through them and minister through them. Um, I don't know how, I don't know when, how, and all this is going to work, okay? I'm just, that's what I'm feeling. I didn't ask for this in advance, I didn't. I, I didn't, if, if, if you feel like you need an anointing with oil, we can do that. Um, but I really just feel like it's time. It's time. We've had a whole bunch of people last week say, I'm willing to give up whatever it was, right? Well, maybe, maybe it's now we're going to do another step. 
that says, okay, now I'm going to become the mercy seat, and I'm going to let the Shekinah glory fall and rest on me. All right, and if you guys are up here, if any of you need to have someone pray with you, man, you've got people up here, I want you to turn and take care of it, okay? Guys in the band, listen, if you feel like you need to pray, and you're in the middle of a song, drop your instrument and come pray, okay? The Lord will cover it, all right? You got it? All right, we're just going to go.